Be sure to check out MythVisionPodcast.com. Help MythVision grow, guys. Become a Patreon member. You guys will get early access to all of my videos when I'm done editing them. Also, it's a small community where you guys can message me your questions and talk to me in private. You guys can donate also through PayPal. Join our social media links down in the description. We have Twitter and Facebook groups. Help the community of MythVision grow. Don't forget to subscribe to this channel. Hit that bell button so you're notified every time I do a live video and you don't miss any of my content. Like this video and comment your thoughts below because I want to know what you think about all of these things. We are myth vision welcome back to the show myth vision podcast your host derek lambert ladies and gentlemen i have samuel zenner that's dr samuel zenner i ought to get hit for this but he has scholars he's a scholar in ancient and modern history language and literature guys he has a academia website make sure you guys go check it out you can see all his articles he has books practically on his edu website here or on the edu link so you guys can go and research and read all this material because he's done this for a long time. And uh, welcome to the show, my friend. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for joining again. You are all the way on planet. What planet is that again? Uh, Mars. It's okay. right next to Casablanca. Casablanca. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, uh, you're really far, which is why I have to put an image up for our audience, because I'm actually viewing you right now. The problem is we're trying to give them the best quality and make it s simple. And who knows, this visual, I might let ride. We we, we got to see how this looks, because uh, you're looking better today in terms of the quality than you did last time. But today, I figure we were going to talk about the temples, something going on with Jesus that was pretty fishy. All right. How did a Jewish guy like him run into this massive temple, start flipping over money changer tables? I mean, does this sound like a real historical, actual situation? Um, you say no. And I'm interested to hear some of your thought pertaining to the temples, money changers, flipping over the tables and the whole nine and all the all that happens in the New Testament. And they characterize it as if this one guy went in there and ran everybody out like. Anyway, mm -hmm. welcome to the channel. Thank you for joining me again today. And ladies and gentlemen, go down in the description and check out his material. So Samuel Zinner, I'm interested to hear what you have to say about this, brother. Well, before we get to the temple, it'd be helpful to, uh, let's see, go back historically on the presumption, right, that uh, at least some of the letters of Paul are authentic. So what I'm referring to is 1 Corinthians 15, a famous passage where Paul uh, talks about uh, the various resurrection appearances of Jesus right, uh, after three days to two various um, disciples or apostles. And uh, he names them, Peter and, and also James. Uh, then then uh, he also says that, that Jesus appeared to more, more than 500 brothers at once or at one time. So there was there was a group uh, appearance, according to Paul. Right now, of course, some scholars dispute uh, this whole passage and say it's it's an interpolation. Paul didn't write it. Um, I, I, personally, I'm convinced Paul wrote it. Right, but the important uh, the importance of that passage is that he ends up the list of all these resurrection appearances with, and then finally he appeared to me. Right? And so that suddenly, now we realize uh, that he's preparing us for what he's going to be writing about uh, concerning resurrection in the, the last part of 1 Corinthians 15, where he explains that resurrection is not a, a resurrection, uh, a somatic resurrection, that is resurrection of the body. According to Paul, the resurrection, the, the body dies, but is raised in uh, the realm of the, the pneuma or the spirit. So it's a spiritual entity that is raised. Right? So that, uh, that then uh, shows us that Paul's understanding of these stories of the resurrection appearances of Jesus, where the, these were not flesh and blood appearances, as we uh, read in the Gospels, uh, in Luke and John, for instance, they, they really go out of the way to stress that Jesus was in his flesh and blood body, 
right, when, when he appeared to the disciples. But Paul doesn't have this idea. This is a later idea. Paul's idea is that the resurrected Jesus, like anyone else who's going to be resurrected, are resurrected in uh, bodies made of spirits, right? So these are spiritual appearances. They're visions, uh, in other words. Uh, th these appearances, after all, right in Hebrew and Greek, the words for appearance, right, it's the same word that you use to uh, uh, talk about a vision. So these are visionary experiences, not flesh and blood appearances. Right? So now let's go back, according to the story, go back three days, right? And a little bit further, right? So the, res uh, the the crucifixion, but then before that, what's the lead up to the crucifixion, right? According to, to all of the gospels, but let's stick with the earliest of the gospels. And that's Mark. And that was the, the incident, uh, the famous incident at the temple where it said that Jesus turns over the tables of the money changers. Uh, all, all right. Derek, let me ask you, uh, do you know, or you know, what is your idea? What were these money changers doing there? What was their job? I mean, why were they there? So from what I understand- what have you heard? <clears throat> yeah, so this is what I understand, and I'm always open to learn and, and consider new ideas. The money changers were there to exchange this foreign money so that they could have kind of a kosher money, so to speak. Um, mm -hmm. The idea is that they're getting these images and coins that are obviously graven mm -hmm. that they cannot take into the temple, which is a holy place. And they're supposed to exchange their money to get this kosher money that it has no images that is Jewish, if you will. And in the process, from right. what I was told, is these money changers were hitting people over the head and they were like, OK, uh, giving them less than the value of the money that they were giving in exchange for the money they were receiving in order to go and buy some sacrifice for their family to have their sins, you know, covered or. Wow. It sounds like someone invented a time machine. That's the only way you could know stuff like that. But anyway, go yeah, ahead. that's exactly what I was told <laughs> though. That I'm just telling you what they, what I've heard is like that this was this, uh, this exchange, almost like we have a foreign exchange place where you can go and get your money. And it, but the idea is that it's, focused on the temple so you have to go into the temple and in order to do that you got to get all these yes yeah yes but what was the what was the money for what was the money for well i mean specifically i was told that the money was <laughs> there to purchase so now you're exchanging your money in order to go and purchase whatever it might be uh for your uh, like a sacrifice through the temple or even to buy certain things there you go there yeah. you go Yes. As for it was, it was to to finance the temple uh, sacrificial system, right? Uh, to keep the sacrificial system going, uh, right, which is demanded by the Torah, and this is according to the Torah the system that God commanded in order uh, to keep this on uh, annually right year after year to to have the sins of israel forgiven right this is why uh this is uh this is what it's all about the money changers were there to keep the sacrificial system operating all right all right so now now we have a story I think I know you're going with this too. Well, we have a story in Mark. He tells us that the Jesus, uh, a Jew, comes into the temple and turns over these tables. Now, look, uh, uh, despite what some Christian scholars and probably even some Jewish scholars these days, right, for ecumenical purposes, uh, despite what a lot of Christian scholars want to believe, Right, this act, it's impossible that this can be interpreted as an act of, let's say, prophetic Jewish reformation, right, or denunciation of wickedness. No, this is a completely uh, anti Jewish 
act. It's impossible uh, to even imagine that a secular Jew could have done this because uh, in doing this, what it means is, right, in the mind of the person doing this, is a total rejection right, of, the, of the, the sacrificial system of the temple, right, which has been commanded by God in the Torah. So this is not a Jewish act. It's not the act of a Jewish prophet. It's not the act of a Jewish reformer. It's not the act of a Jewish military messiah. If I if I may ask this, I want to poke because I know you've heard this probably objection because you mm. countless readings. One of the objections that I've heard people say is that there were certain fringe sects of Judaism that rejected the temple and the leadership and stuff. And therefore, and they go to like references where he's like, I did not care for a sacrifice. Uh, uh, they use these right. kind of like, um, you know, specifics only here in their verses to kind of give this idea that God is not pleased with your sacrifice. It's about your inward. It's about your heart. It's like this idea that, you know, you're not really doing that. You're just doing this just to do it. You're not really in this world oh, throw up the torah then right where where it says right it, god's eternal commandments right is for these these animal sacrifices and other types of sacrifices with flour and what have you but no yes for instance the qumran sectarians right rejected the current temple leadership they however did not condemn the temple in itself nor did they condemn right the the sacrificial system as such right so th uh, that that's a misrepresentation if you want to go that far right thank you joan taylor uh, joan taylor uh, a fine scholar right has written one of the finest most recent books on the uh, scenes and she demonstrates in there that actually there's been a lot of exaggeration and misinterpretation even about qumran right uh, right as far as their rejection of the temple uh, sacrifices, uh, but right. So the not even Qumran, right, would uh, go so far as to say, well, you know, the, the temple and the sacrifices uh, sh should just be destroyed, right? And their idea was that in the future God was going to take care of of that uh, wicked uh, temple, le current temple leadership. Right, and uh, angels are going to come out of the sky. There's going to be a big uh, apocalyptic war, and that's going to settle the issue. Right, so there was no uh, no rejection of the temple and the sacrificial system per se by any second temple Jewish group. Uh, so only uh, only uh, condemnation right uh, of uh, the current uh, leadership. Right, who are operating the temple. So the way uh, that that would be addressed is right. You, you could have prophets or prophet-like characters or reformers, uh, you know, condemning the sins, the wickedness of the uh, current high priests or priests or or the leadership. But they wouldn't be preaching against the Torah and saying, you know, contradicting the Torah and saying, well, then the the uh, system that god put in place for the forgiveness of the nation of israel right that's all bunk we that's just uh we it's gone right uh in any case um so to to, to overturn the tables is to completely reject right the revelation in the torah and the the eternal commandments in the torah right that specify right the the uh, uh, annual operation Right, of the animal sacrifice, animal sacrificial system, right, in, in the temple. That is why, and it is, it's Rabbi Jacob Neusner points this out in a lot of his, the late uh, Rabbi Neusner points this out in many of his, in uh, his works, right, he, he either published or edited over a thousand books, right, he was just, uh, he was always busy, a tremendous scholar, and he points out that, all right, so yeah, that act of overturning the tables is an act uh, uh, of complete rejection of Judaism. That, that there's no other way to look at it. And that's why the next uh, part of the story is what? The Eucharist, the institution of the Eucharist. What Mark is implying there is that, yes, Jesus came. 
and the sacrificial system that God set up in the Torah, and he replaced it with the Eucharist, the Christian Eucharist, right? So, and so the, the, let right? Me get and the earliest count of the Eucharist comes from where? First Corinthians 11, from Paul. And he gets it according, uh, he says by revelation or by, by tradition, but uh, you know, a lot of scholars uh, agree that th this is a vision that he has had. Whether or not it's a vision, uh, in any case, you can see what function it it plays right, in the Gospel of Mark and in and in the later Gospels. Right? It's so, the rejection so Zinner, of the animal sacrificial system of the temple replaced by the Christian Eucharist. Doctor Zenner, let me ask you this: so to put this in simple terms, what we see, if you're looking into this, you're trying to wonder what is Christianity, what is this Jesus guy, what is this whole believe in Jesus and he he is the sacrifice. It is foreign to Judaism, number one. Not saying it doesn't That's come right. out of the milieu right. or to some degree using the milieu of Judaism, but it is foreign mm -hmm. to Judaism, which means something interjected from outside of Judaism into a version or a form kind of syncretizing Judaism into this new uh, new mutt, if you will, of a, of a system it's mm. not it's 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 got elements of Judaism. It comes out of it, but it does something radically different by changing the whole heart of the sacrificial system and letting a man, a man God, of course, uh, mm. fit the centerfold sacrifice of this system, which is pagan. I mean, if, if I can use the word pagan, but I mean, what I'm saying is, is it's it's not Jewish. And therefore, no, that, that mm. should lead that should lead someone to ask more questions at this point. Like the, the, the catalyst was the destruction of the temple by the Romans in in, the, in seventy of the Common Era, the year seventy of the Common Era. Right. And so, this story of Jesus basically rejecting Judaism and the system that God has set in place for the forgiveness of the sins of Israel with uh, the the Christian Eucharist. This is a, a meme that uh, could have been already in circulation bef before the Jewish war, right, which ended after uh, 70. But uh, in Mark, it's definitely post-70 of the Common Era. And what has happened is that now this story is, uh, is anti-Jewish, it's anti-Temple. And why? The, the, it's pro-Roman. That's what's behind all of this. Now, Josephus, who was a Jewish priest, right, writing about uh, uh, the Jewish war after the fact, right, in, in, with uh, the, the Roman victory over Israel uh, in view, right, uh, he has promotes the trope that, well, God abandoned the Jews and now he's with the Romans, right? So you see right, the pressure Right, that was exerted on this uh, this this victory of Rome over over Judea, right? The, uh, in that war, right, to appease the Romans, not to upset them, right, to say things uh, that are positive, right, um, because it it was a, a grand tragedy, right, a grand tragedy, and uh, the, the untold uh, death. Right, and so uh, after seventy, uh, you're in a very uh, you're in a volatile situation politically and religiously. Right, Look, Dr. Uh, Zinner, have you heard of Paul George uh, in his book on Christian origins, where ultimately he believes that Christianity itself, what we know of as ultimately Christianity, sprung up from the ashes of the seventy you know, destruction of the temple, if you will. So technically, I mean, there were obviously earlier forms of messianic Judaism and whatnot, but mm -hmm. what we see in Pauline and ultimately Christian Jesus, uh, uh, soteriology and Christology and the mm -hmm. whole, not the whole concept comes out of the ashes of the 70 war. And I, I want to ask that if you haven't read that book, that this kind of has these implications because the temple's destroyed. And now we need to 
replace mm -hmm. this system with uh, something that's going to syncretize the culture of the Romans and these Messianists. But uh, what are your thoughts? Right. I, I think that, that, the, that the claim that, that everything arises after 70 CE is, is, is an exaggeration because we know that there was an anticipation, right? Leading, uh, even before the war, and this was the whole concept in Alexandria, right? In Alexandria and Hellenistic Judaism, uh, faithful Jews, for instance, uh, Philo of Alexandria. Uh, but we do learn from him a vital fact that, uh, well, you see, his teaching was that when you interpret the Torah, when you read, a, a, for instance, about the commandments for circumcision or for animal sacrifices, there are two levels of understanding to be deployed. One is the literal of the literal understanding, literal interpretation, and the other is the allegorical, right, or symbol. Uh, and uh, Philo insists, right, the the literal is like the body, the, the allegorical is like the soul. Uh, to be a living being, you need both the body and the soul. So you have to. Uh, circumcise your children, your, your sons, and you have to do the sacrifices, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, uh, along with understanding the, the spiritual depths, right, of these, these physical. But Philo tells us that there were people, there were Jews uh, in his time, right, learning the spiritual depths right, uh, the spiritual interpretation, allegorical interpretation of, let's say, circumcision and all the other commandments, the mitzvot in the Torah, that they said, well, that's all you need. Uh, so now we'll just leave all the physical stuff behind. We, won't, we don't need to circumcise because after all, the real circumcision is the circumcision of the heart, right? So they throw away the body and keep the soul, right, from Philo's perspective. So these are extremists. Right, so these are uh, extremist allegorists, right? And so uh, this understanding of the temple, which would allegorize it all away, right, was already in existence even before the first century of the Common Era. So there, 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 uh, there was a con conceptual framework in place, right, right, that was used, right, even before the the first Jewish War, which broke out. And I, if my memory serves me, it's more like 67, right? the year 67 of the Common Era, right? And uh, the, the temple is destroyed in 70, but the war lingered on for a year or two after that, actually. Um, on the presumption, right, that for instance, 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, the uh, letter to the Galatians are basically written by Paul. Uh, there may be some interpolations right, in all of those letters, but uh, the bulk of them, I believe, are written by this historical Paul in the uh, basically the 40s, right, when, when, when this uh, mission was going on to the Gentiles. And already then, right, there would be uh, an impetus, right, uh, and a reason why uh, some of these uh, extremist uh, allegorists ideas, right, would be invoked, right? Um, and of course, from a rabbinic perspective, there's no problem with saying, all right, we're, we're gonna to try to make monotheists out of pagans and for them to be all right with God, they don't need to be circumcised. That's fine, as long as they uh, live by, you know, this handful of uh, laws, which are called the laws of Noah, the Noahide laws. You read about them in Acts 15. You can also find uh, them basically the same in, in the in the Talmudic literature. Talmudic literature, right? So, uh, what was uh, problematic from uh, a Jewish perspective was that not only was this argument being made that all right, so Jew, uh, Gentiles don't need to be circumcised, right? But it was Paul's teaching that the law also uh, was uh, no longer binding on Jews, right, including Jews in the Jesus movement. Right? And so this is where James, right, the, the brother of Jesus, James, uh, 
Uh, this is where the conflict between the Jerusalem uh, uh, Jesus group and Paul uh, uh, arose. Right? This is what it's all about. Right? So technically, so, Paul is this extreme allegorist, and the other Jews yeah. are kind of like Philo, and they're saying, no, dude, you, you got it wrong, okay? And Paul's going, no, you guys are stiff-necked, and you don't realize the stumbling block, which is the law, and the bottom line is mm -hmm. you have this outward, you have the, the letter, okay? The letter kills, but the spirit gives life, and this hits all this allegorical, philo, really platonic, Hellenistic uh -huh. language. Uh -huh. Right. And I know that, you know, like uh, the, the, the new schools of thought on Paul, right, would, would uh, reject everything I'm saying. Right. But, right. There are, uh, you know, very respected scholars today who also, uh, right, would reject this uh, new, uh, most of the, not everything, but, uh, but I would say the basics uh, of the new ways of thinking about Paul. And uh, for instance, John J. Collins, right, a very respected scholar internationally, uh, in his recent book, it's called The Invention of Judaism, right, from like Deuteronomy to Paul. He has an entire chapter in there where he takes apart uh, really uh, in a very forceful way uh, all of these basic, what I would call exaggerations and, uh, and uh, just misinterpretation, erroneous claims in the, the new school, in the, in the schools, uh, right, of this new way of thinking about Paul, which is now morphed into, of course, what's called the Paul within Judaism, right, movement or, or school of thought, right. Uh, another a very respected person is a Finnish scholar who, who unfortunately passed away not too long ago, and that is uh, uh, Heike Ritainen, right, his, his, uh, he, his, uh, literature also is very forceful in exposing the the erroneous claims of a lot of these uh, new Pauline uh, s scholars, right? Who are, who are both Christian and some are Jewish, right? Uh, Dr. Zinner, I think I'm going to call John J. Collins, Dr. Collins, and actually get him back on the show to wrestle with Paul. Uh, I, I, I've got his actual cell phone number, you know, and, and mm -hmm. this gentleman is literally brilliant. I love the way he expounds on these things, like just listening to him speak even. I mean, of course, when you read him, you know what I'm talking about. But like just hearing him communicate right. it is you. Uh, I really value that you brought his name up because he is something else when it comes to academic uh, work. He's just a monster when it comes mm -hmm. to this stuff. And I love that. So maybe mm -hmm. I can have a collaborative method someday, but I definitely need to get him on and talk about this particular area. I know that you'd enjoy that episode <laughs> for sure. So um, I, this is interesting. I, I just want to say this. Is, I'm not expanding. I'm not even asking questions. I just want to point out that I hear all sorts of ideas and this isn't one that hasn't, this isn't one that's been discussed this way. Nobody on the show has even mentioned this idea of these extreme algorithms in the way that you've described them and pointing out the, I guess I've heard this, but said completely different and didn't know to think of it like the mm -hmm. way you're presenting this. The perception you're giving is a strange new way of, for me, because I'm not familiar with this kind of perception. Mm -hmm. I, I came from the Christian worldview, right? So like, it's difficult to see the way that you're presenting this, but back to the temple, because that's the topic and we can wrap the show up whenever you want in terms of like talking about mm -hmm. the temple and whatnot, because we have more to cover in, in different uh, sure. areas, but it's apparently clear to you. And I think others also think that this might play a huge role. I know that Dennis McDonald, Dr. McDonald, I'm going to be bringing him on as mm -hmm. well, says that he thinks the motif of the cleansing of the temple and flipping of the money changers is actually a Homeric motif that uh, Odysseus actually coming home and kicking the, the thieves out of his own home that were trying to take his wife and whatnot and possibly kill his son. He comes in and he pretends to be the beggar and they end up saying, mm -hmm. well, who can string this bow? And sure enough, the beggar, which is actually Odysseus strings it and takes all these guys out that are in his house um, it's not literally paralleled in any literal sense, but 
the motif uh, he believes does play a significant role, which would be interesting because I asked on the show and he wasn't sure. I said, is this historical? Does it mean it's completely fiction because he borrows it from Homer or is there a historical relevance to this that a real Mm -hmm. guy went in and tried to cleanse the temple? Or is this a foreshadowing kind of of kind of how Odysseus went to war with Troy, then he comes back later, nobody expects him to come again. And he comes back for the second mm-hmm. time, the second coming. And what's he do at the second coming? Right. He kicks everyone's, you know what, out of the temple. And so right, uh, right. I don't know if there's some right. type of but, strange. But it's a misnomer. Mm-hmm. Right. But but uh, the terminology, right, the cleansing of the temple, this is a misnomer. Because this this is the Christian desire to present the act as an act by a faithful Jew who wanted to clean things up and reform something that was wicked, even from a Jewish perspective. It's a misnomer. It's not a cleansing of the temple. It's a rejection of the temple system as instituted by God in the Torah. It's as supersessionist as you can get, right? And then that's replaced with the Eucharist, right? And so this is, uh, this is, uh, for me, as a historian, the way I uh, grapple with this, the way I interpret this, right, is, is of course, I'm yet, I, I have to be humble. We can really never know what happened, right? But we, as historians, we can try to establish a scale of probabilities based on uh, all of the different sources we have, as problematic as they all are, including Josephus, right, who is not an objective historian, always, right? But if you look at it this way, all right, now, so from Josephus, of course, everything I've been saying can be contested by the various sides, <laughs> right? But if you look at Josephus, right, uh, his story about James, the, the brother of, of Jesus, right, uh, shows us something very important for the history uh, of so-called early Christianity. And that is that, that James, was even though he was uh, uh, executed, right, uh, it, it, uh, the, the fairest minded, the most uh, fairest minded people uh, and religious authorities at the time condemned the execution. Right? So it was considered uh, uh, unjust. Right? My point is this, that the mainstream of Judaism, right? had great respect for James, the brother of Jesus, who, and he, uh, who was the leader right, of this Jesus group. So at that time, what does that tell you? That tells you that the, the group, led by James at least, right, was considered uh, a Jewish uh, sect or group, uh, just as Jewish as the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the Essenes, right? And so what does that tell you? Historically, hmm. it makes no sense Right, that Jesus right, had rejected the, the sacrificial system and had replaced it with the Eucharist. Because if, if that story had been around, if that claim had, had been there, there's no way that James would, uh, ha, have, would not have been repudiated by the Jewish authorities, right? especially all the way to the end of his life in the 60s. So this was not a, a, a Pauline uh, group. With Pauline theology, which would not have been tolerated. So uh, certainly James was not preaching against the Torah. He, uh, he was not uh, preaching against the temple. And uh, all the way into the, to the early 60s. And so it, uh, for me, it then makes no sense that, well, Jesus, right, uh, who, who was the founder of this group, uh, right, would not have uh, had the same basic ideas, uh, you know, that James was promoting. And so it, it makes no sense that Jesus would have uh, been this this uh, apostate, basically. I mean, if a Jew had done what, what he is said to have done, according to Mark, it would be an, 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 an apostate. Right. right? And I mean, a group, I... right, that continued in his name would not have been tolerated. What would you say of him saying you were by the Jewish my, authorities? You turned my father's house into a den of thieves. 
um, if I were to play devil's advocate and say, well, no, Jesus wasn't against the temple or this. He was against these guys specifically. How would you respond to the statement? Mm -hmm. You're turning my father's house into a den of thieves, like uh, that he's acting like right. this is his Which is a quotation. House. Right. Right. So quotation from the Tanakh. Right. So, yeah, sure. The prophets uh, certainly would denounce. And they did denounce, right, uh, unrighteousness, right, among temple leaders, for instance. As you see, they never reject, right, the system. Right? They denounce individuals' uh, unrighteous deeds, right, and wicked hearts and all this, but they don't uh, repudiate the temple system that was set up by God in the Torah. So this, this is the difference. It remains the difference. So uh, what, what Mark is trying to do, right, is uh, he wants to avoid the appearance, right, uh, that Jesus, well, see, there's a tension. He wants to placate the Roman side, right, and show, well, look, you know, this, our founder, right, this is basically Pauline movement, our founder, right, rejected the Judaism rejected the temple, the temple system and replaced it with the Eucharist. But at the same time, right, there's no way that, uh, that Mark could deny that, well, actually the, the Jesus movement, right, did, right, come out of uh, a Torah faithful, temple faithful uh, Jewish group led by uh, Jesus, right, who was faithful to Torah and to temple. And uh, so, Right, so there, in order to sort of placate the Jewish side, right? Now, how do you do that? Well, you know, you, you lift a few lines from the Tanakh, right? Like to try to suggest that this cleansing was some kind of, from a Jewish perspective, some kind of justifiable act. But the problem is, right, that from a Jewish perspective, uh, this is just uh, anyone doing what he did, right, is, is simply repudiating uh, Judaism. It's, it's, it's from another universe, right? Um, and this is a point that, that Rabbi Neusner, Jacob Neusner, made in his books that, uh, you know, despite what all these Christian scholars, you know, how they want to turn the so-called cleansing of the temple into this prophetic reformation. Uh, I mean, if, I mean, from a Jewish perspective, this is something that happens in a different universe. I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's, it is a complete rejection uh, of the Torah. There's no two ways of getting around it. So Dr. Zenner, I, I, let me ask this in a way because, I mean, nobody has all the answers, of course, but it's great to hear different uh, opinions on this. And I'd like to get sure. your thoughts. Do you think, and I know that this doesn't necessarily work for all 27 New Testament books that we have, uh, and there's an evolution mm -hmm. that's taking place even in the movement, which is obvious here. But do you think this was written to try and, uh, let me, I'm going to use some words here that are going to sound vulgar, like intense, but. They're not trying to spit in the Jew's face, so to speak, maybe mm -hmm. in some places. Um, they're trying to convince Jews. I'm just asking this question, and maybe you could tell me mm -hmm. if you don't agree with the question, you don't think that that's the case. I'd like to know what you think is. Do you think they're trying to convince Jews in, in the writings of the New Testament, as well as a Gentile audience, that mm -hmm. God's doing a new thing and he's okay with the removing of the old system and replacing it with a new system. Do you think they're trying to convince Jews of this? Or do you think this is purely a Gentile thing? Oh, well, it depends on each of the books, but if you look at the letter to the Hebrews, you, you there, at least in that case, it's obviously, I mean, that letter, right. We could be called the letter against the Hebrews, right? Because it's attacking the beliefs of Hebrew or Jewish <laughs> followers of Jesus. That's what that, that whole thing is about, right? And so the argument is, well, look, Jeremiah right, told us that the time was coming when the, uh, God would draw up a new covenant, 
with Israel. <clears throat> and so new, well, that means that there's an old, and if it's old, it's passing away and dying, and there's something new, right? Which is uh, totally taking Jeremiah chapter 31 out of context. Right? And, uh, you know, uh, the, new, the time of the new covenant, according to Jeremiah 31, will be a time where uh, human beings will no longer need to be taught about God. They will just spontaneously know God, right? Now, Christianity claims that uh, Jesus brought the new covenant, but th this is preposterous. Now, uh, Judaism has never made that claim. Judaism still insists that now that era of the new covenant when there will be no need for teachers, there will be no teachers at all, religious teachers, spiritual teachers. That's for the, the messianic age, for the world to come, for the eschaton, uh, right, as, as it's called in, in Christian scholarship, right? So uh, that time has not come. Uh, but that does bring up a point, right, that what, is, what was the whole trope about these spiritual appearances of the resurrected Jesus about? It was the fact that from a Jewish perspective, when Jesus uh, died on the cross, he had not fulfilled all of the messianic prophecies, which uh, most of them are national, sort of like militaristic even prophecies. And then, then there's going to be international peace, uh, et cetera, et cetera. These were not fulfilled. So the idea there was that, well, Jesus is still alive in spirit, right? Not in body, Ooh. but in spirit, he's still alive. So his work is not finished, <laughs> right? So, so for, for the James group, the you know, Jewish Christians, so to speak, their argument would have been, well, yes, he, he is alive. And so he still uh, has the, the uh, opportunity to fulfill those prophecies, right? Wow. And until he does, we can't name, we can't call him the Messiah. Right, uh, except in some what's called a proleptic sense, an anticipatory sense that's not to be taken literally. Right uh, now, the only way uh, you can get to saying that well, he is the Messiah is if you believe that he's fulfilled all the prophecies, and the only way you can do that is by turning the Old Testament prophecies, the Tanakh prophecies, into spiritual allegories. Okay, so it's not about international peace; it's about uh, peace. Right between uh, brothers and sisters, right in in the Lord or whatever, right. Uh, the the prophecies about peace between animals and humans. Well, that's the animal nature of humans will be conquered by the righteous interior spirit. All, all these types of ideas, right. And then you could say, well, he's the Christ. He's fulfilled all these prophecies. The problem is, um, if you read the Gospels and Acts, you will see that uh, even uh, even during the, the resurrection appearances, Jesus is, right, his disciples are confused. They say, well, aren't you bringing in the messianic government? I'm paraphrasing, of course, right? But so that what that shows you is that apparently for the whole year that they had known Jesus and his teaching and running around the Judean and Galilean countryside with him, uh, he, he had been saying nothing that contradicts the traditional Jewish picture of Messiah, of a messianic military leader, right? Uh, so why would they be, it's the same thing, right? About the mission of the Gentiles, it, uh, right? In the gospels, uh, right? I mean, in the book of Acts, um, when, when some of the, the disciples of Jesus began to missionize among Gentiles, this is very controversial. They said, well, hey, uh, you know, basically what, the picture is that, well, Jesus never said anything about this, right? Uh, so when you go to the Gospels and there are sayings in there that Jesus purportedly talks about a mission to the Gentiles, these cannot be historical. It's just right. have to be taken in a theological sense. I mean, they can even have good ethics and morals about them, but Jesus would uh, have historically would have presented himself, well, <laughs> probably not presented himself, but he would have talked about the, the coming Messiah in traditional terms uh, as a military uh, uh, leader. Now, Dr. So the Zinner, Gospels, what the Gospels have to do, sure, go ahead. You, you, you blew my, my brain a, a while back, and I have to just say this. I, look, whenever you drop a bomb on me, like I have to repeat it for my audience to catch that, to digest that, to 
Cause like you, this is like common knowledge to you. And this is not for me necessarily, even though I've heard a lot of this, what you did for me. Cause I'm like all about the death and resurrection of Jesus and stuff like that. And like, you have two schools of thought that I typically deal with mythicist and you have historicist and the historicist will say, mm. usually cognitive dissonance and this cognitive, usually the way they approach it right. though, is if you lose a loved one, you just can't let them go. Therefore, because they're a loved one, you kind of experience them mm. after they die and this kind of stuff that might be partially true. If historicism is true, here's the thing. What sure. I like about what you said is it's deeper than just a loved one. It's a religious and this might explain why there's so much Christology, like developed Christology right there at the beginning. And it didn't take forever for this Christology to build up. Cause I asked myself like big head scratcher to me is like, how does 15 years after the guy supposedly died and they say rose again, how do you have this so well-developed um, systematic Christology with all this stuff formulated around this one guy? How can you do that unless mm -hmm. This is this religious, the religious and eschatological motif, this apocalyptic motif that they expected the Messiah to do these things. They really believed he was the Messiah. The cognitive dissonance is playing a role. They can't let go of that. And therefore, when he died, they know that he's the Messiah because they believe him, all right? like anyone who believes in a particular cult leader or something. And therefore, even when he died, they're like, nope, this is what's supposed mm -hmm. to happen. He's still doing it. It's just in a spiritual realm. And that's where Hellenism plays a huge role because people don't realize how, I don't think a mm. lot of people that, that I know that I communicate with recognize how much Hellenism plays a role. But anyway, I like what but you even did in there. Palestine, ancient Palestine. Right. And that's like I in the Jewish world and what that does in the mind of the Jewish people compared to what you would see in Tanakhs, uh, in the Tanakh, you, you really cannot grasp why they allegorized or spiritualized to that level of things. So then technically anyone could say anything was fulfilled, even if it wasn't. That's what's that's that's when we start getting well, into like all that you, stuff. You, you see, you see what's operative, right? When you get to the, with the gospel of Matthew, he'll quote to knock prophecies, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and say that uh, you know Isaiah 53 says uh, that he has healed us by his stripes. Right? And uh, Matthew says, well, this was fulfilled when Jesus was going around uh, Judea or Galilee healing people. Right? Uh, or, or Isaiah 7, right? The, the young woman will conceive and have a son, right? This was fulfilled in the story of Jesus' birth, right? But Matthew really knows that, right, from a Jewish perspective, you can't, these are not literal fulfillments uh, of passages from the Tanakh. And this is why he has, Matthew has Jesus say, I thank you, Father, right, Lord uh, of heaven and earth, that you have not revealed these things to the learned and the wise, but to the babes, but to the infants. All right? Did you catch that? So what's going on there is that, right, if if you as a Jew cannot see that Isaiah was talking about Jesus' birth in Isaiah 7, well, you're one of those learned and wise guys, right? Arrogant in your own conceit, right? But because you can't see what it's allegorically pointing to in a, on a hidden esoteric level, what it's all about. So Matthew is sort of conceding that, yeah, these prophecies uh, are not, we're not literally fulfilled by Jesus. They're only fulfilled in a sort of like a symbolic typological sense that only the spiritual infant can recognize. If you use your God-given mind, you won't be able to see it. Right? Let me, so he, uh, this is very Pauline, by the way. I this need to ask you Pauline something about strategy, that. There's a debate going on sure. that happens between Rabbi Tovia Singer, who is a Orthodox Jew, and Michael Brown, who's a Christian apologist. Right. And this debate right now that mm -hmm. I heard, and there's a little clip, uh, did Paul quote a phantom scripture in 1 Corinthians 15? Now, I know we're kind of getting off the temple's destruction, but it's in the vein of the idea of resurrection and the replacement of the No, temple. it's related. 
And he says uh, in That's 1 right. Corinthians 15, Dr. Brown responds to Rabbi Tovia Singer. And <clears throat> the apologetic argument by Dr. Brown is he believes that there wasn't need, there was no lost scripture or lost text of some sort, but that the mm -hmm. he's referencing these kind of uh, uh, these parable type Hosea six, you know, on the third day concepts, Jonah in the belly of the well on the third I day. I will revive you on the third day. Right. And so technically the idea is that, what Rabbi Tobias Singer is saying is that there's got to be a missing text here because in Mark 9, he says, and yet how is it written of the Son of Man that he will suffer many things and be treated with contempt? Um, the idea is that, like in Matthew 17, it says, but I say to you that Elijah already came and they did not recognize him, but did to him whatever they wished. So also the Son of Man is going to suffer at their hands. In Matthew, though, it doesn't say it is written. In Mark, it says it's written. It's written of him. And, uh, and then Luke says, thus it is written that the Christ would suffer and rise again from the dead the third day, and the repentance of forgiveness of sins would mm -hmm. be proclaimed in his name to all the nations begin, beginning from Jerusalem. So the question then becomes, mm -hmm. is there a missing text? And Rabbi Tobias Singer and other rabbis would say, yeah, there's obviously – the argument is infallibility, inerrancy, like God didn't preserve this text. Where is this text these Christians have? that say explicitly it is written, thus it is written, that the Christ would suffer and rise again from the dead the third day. Well, Michael Brown's apologetic is, no. no, they don't understand the motif of scripture. And maybe he's right, I'm asking you, that the idea isn't not necessarily that he's correct in his views of Christianity and whatnot, but the idea is that these guys are allegorizing and creating doctrine right. out of these texts. But it does say, it That's is right. written he would suffer and rise. Do you think they're reading into those things and creating that? Or do you think there was a text that the Messiah would suffer and rise somewhere that we just don't have? No, I think I would disagree with both sides there and uh, sort of uh, lean towards what you're saying. Uh, when it's written, for instance, 1 Corinthians 15, right on the third day, right? This is Hosea, right? But that's not what Hosea is literally talking about, right? And we know from early Christian literature, from the so-called New Testament, from the, 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 the great apologists like Justin, was after him. <coughs> uh, <coughs> we know the very scriptures. Uh, and apparently at a very early time, these were actually gathered together in what scholars call a testimonia, testimonia list, right? Um, uh, we know all these scriptures that early Christians uh, collected from the Tanakh uh, that they then allegorized, right, and uh, derived and based all of these claims on. So I, I don't think that they're, they're referring to any missing uh, text, right? That but, like explicitly um, says. Against, right. Right, against Michael Brown, you know, I wouldn't agree. I, I would have to insist that, well, uh, that, that this is not what the Tanakh is saying on a literal level. The only way you can get that out of there, what the early Christians were claiming, is, is to spiritualize the text, allegorize the text. Right? And, but see, this, this actually makes sense in view of the ultimate divide between what became rabbinic Judaism and Christianity. And that is that... Uh, there, the ultimate divide involves the, the dyad, right? The, the, the contrast between the public and the private. Judaism is founded on a public national revelation, right? Uh, according to the Torah, right? That God appeared uh, to 600,000, to the entire Jewish nation and said, this, right, these are my commandments, this is how you live, and these are eternal. Right? And everyone heard it. You didn't, you didn't, so you didn't have Moses saying, well, you know, I went up to the mountain and God told me this. Now everyone heard it. So it's a public revelation to 600,000 people. Now, this is what Paul is trying to, to uh, claim Christianity as in 1 Corinthians 15 by giving the story of that Jesus appeared to more than 500 brothers at once, as if it's some kind of public 
a new public revelation because the only way that you could uh, see, theoretically overturn the Torah right, is by only God who could do that by coming down again, right? On some mountain and, and, and the whole nation of Israel seeing it, witnessing it, right? However, that's also theoretically, theoretically, right? Theologically incompatible with the Torah because when God did come down in the time of Moses, he's, he said that this is an eternal covenant. Right, for as long as heaven and earth are here, right? So not until the second temple will be destroyed, but as long as heaven and earth are here, right? This is an eternal uh, covenant, right? Uh, with Israel. So, right? so, so, Dr. so, but we see Paul, the problem is that, okay, let's say if Jesus did publicly appear to 500 people, so what? It has to be to the whole nation, right? Otherwise, uh, from a Jewish perspective, uh, even if what the guy's saying and what the group is saying is true, we can't accept it because God told us otherwise, and only uh, only God could uh, tell us to now go some other direction. But he hasn't. So you say he's appeared. So he's appeared to five hundred people at once. Not enough. He has to appear to the entire nation. That's why Luke has the story of the descent of the spirit on the day of Pentecost when all when Jews and righteous people from all nations were gathered together, right? So this is like, uh, and, and in the story of Pentecost, it, according to Luke, you'll see a lot of literary allusions to the story uh, in the Tanakh, uh, in the Torah of God descending on, on Mount Sinai with the flames and all of this, right? So he's, they're trying to create the impression that this Christianity is now a new revelation, just as public, publicly revealed as the Torah, but, uh, <laughs> right, but you see this actually, you see, I think it was Joachim Jeremias, the great uh, New Testament scholar, points out in his, uh, one of his books, uh, not too many catch this, but really what Paul is alluding to, right, when Jesus appeared to 500 people at once, is probably the story of Pentecost, right, so it's just a spiritual appearance, Right, and th there is a, a very uh, obscure text, an, an Ethiopic text. I'm not sure if it's from late antiquity or maybe it's medieval, but old Butch uh, translated it back in 1899. It's called the, in English, the Contendings of the Apostles. And in there, you have this bizarre story, 10 days after the ascension, not 40, but 10 days after the ascension, the followers of Jesus, uh, offer up a sacrifice, James is uh, offering it up, and the flames are there, and then that's when the Pentecost story happens, and it, he, this text says that uh, there were 700 people there, 200 from the nations, and more than 500 Hebrews. So th this is, uh, the more than 500, this is the same phrase in First Corinthians, 15, more than 500. So uh, this is referring to uh, not Paul, but Luke is basing his, I think his, his Pentecost story on 1 Corinthians 15, uh, the appearance of more than 500 brothers at once. This is the story uh, of Pentecost, but th this is not a public revelation. The, uh, the, the only people who saw anything were those who were already in the movement, right? In the group, right? Anyway, um, this this so is great. It, that's what it comes down to, right? So the Gospel of John, right, has Jesus saying, "Well, it's more blessed to believe than to see," right? So that's a polemic, right? Going back to the whole Torah, which the whole nation of Israel saw, mm -hmm. right, and believed. That's turned on his head by John. It, it right? constantly, and there's the a whole, lot of that. There's because of the fact yeah. that the new Christian claim, the new revelation, right, is 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 Founded on a private revelation, not on a public revelation as the Torah is. So that's the ultimate divide between rabbinic Judaism and Christianity. There's a lot of public that in the New Testament. There's so much of the uh, you will ask for a sign, but no sign will be given. You don't need one. You know, this these ideas of them needing some type of uh, assurance. And I think that polemic of saying, 
oh, you know, blessed are those who don't see. The idea is don't, you don't need it, just believe. And and I, I even think that keeps people in the faith, this trying to right. keep people from leaving the faith. But uh, uh, Dr. Zinner, I think we covered this topic pretty good. Right. Did you want to go ahead and uh, say some closing words for that? Yeah. Yeah, just a final point for right from an ecumenical stance, right? Uh, see, I, I I don't mean to lambast uh, Christianity. I don't mean to offend anyone or or disrespect their faith. Uh, but the fact is that in ecumenism, if you want it to be fruitful, if you want to have a fruit bug with people in another religion, it has to be based on honesty. It has to be based on recognition of the facts. Right, and then mutual respect, right, for both sides, right? All right, so what does that mean for someone like me? It's like, all right, uh, it's fine, right? Christians have this concept that the, the Tanakh was prophesying something that uh, can only be understood esoterically, symbolically, allegorically. All right, I respect that, right? That's fine. That helps a lot of people live. Right. And so uh, in, in an honest dialogue, then right, that favor has to be returned from the other side. Right. So it's like they have to respect the Jews just can't see that. Right. And that's all right. Right. Mm -hmm. And both religions are going to continue for as long as this planet continues. And that's all right. Right. But if we can learn the art of mutual respect, well, maybe the planet eventually will be a little bit better place to live. Anyway, there you go. Well, ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Samuel Zinner. So thank you so much for joining me on this episode. I know that we will explore more topics together. He has written extensively. So I want you guys to grab a hold of some of his works in that academia.edu uh, link down here in the description. Is there a way to help you uh, somehow? Do you have a, a way where people can help you in some way, shape, or form with your research or what you do? Is there something like that available for you, Dr. Zenner? Uh, I don't think so. <laughs> Unless someone wants to support me through like uh, Western Union, right? Because I'm not in the States, right? So, you know, people outside of the States, especially uh, as long as I'm in Casablanca, you know, we, we can't donate, for instance, on YouTube. To uh, I mean, you know, the the just the financial structures in other places do that. But well, so you might need to get way. PayPal so to support my work. They would have to get uh, a whole. They would have to contact me directly, right? Uh, and I mean, it's, it's a little inconvenient, but you know, I'm not. I don't live in America, and uh, you have to excuse uh, uh, how I speak because uh, I don't speak English every day. So I mean, my, I know my. I understand my grammar is not the best at all times, right? Uh, it's, it's been many, many years uh, since uh, I spoke English on a daily basis. But anyway, uh, they would, if someone wants to help me uh, support my research, they, they would have to get a hold of me. Uh, and they can find, they could do that through academia.edu. Uh, or if you supply other links, right, the, they'll see my email address. They would just have to get a hold of me. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we've finished that topic. Let me know what you guys think about Jesus turning over the money changers. Do you think Dr. Zinner's on the money? I think this was an interesting topic. I really enjoyed all the other stuff involved in this because there's so much to discover. The fact that they had to have their Messiah fulfill all these things that he didn't do during being alive. We got to keep him alive. But I mean, it's not like they did it in, in any fraudulent uh, way. I think they like really have a superstitious system and cognitive distance may play a role if there was a guy named Jesus. Let me know what you guys think down in the comment section. Hit that like button, subscribe, share this thing out there. Let, every, let everyone know about Myth Vision because I mean, I don't even know if you guys remember. We are. Myth vision, ladies and gentlemen. Myth vision. <laughs>